Welcome to the Glenn Mercer Show, where we talk all things vegan. If you're not already vegan, no worries, we'll get you there. If you are, tune in for health advice, information on climate change, and all the damage done by our most destructive industry, animal agriculture. We'll also talk cooking, theater, film, and culture. My two reasons for starting this podcast, to entertain, to inform, and to make people vegan. Oh, that's three. Shit. Welcome to the Glenn Mercer Show. You can find us across all your favorite podcast platforms. You could find us on YouTube. And please remember to subscribe. You could find us at realmeneatplants.com. I have a very special guest today. Paul Shapiro is the CEO of the Better Meat Company. He is the author of the national bestseller, Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner and the World. He's a five-time TEDx speaker, and he's the host of the Business for Good podcast. In 2023, he was named a most admired CEO by the Sacramento Business Council, and I will add, he and I have been very good friends for about 72 hours. Paul, oh, <laughs> welcome to the show. I, I can't believe that you, ne you neglected, Glenn, that we might also be biologically related. That's possible. That's yeah. possible. There, there. We've looked into that, and we have to go back several generations, but yes. it is possible that you're my cousin. You're, you know, some people are my brother from another mother. You're my cousin from another mother. There you go. Yeah. Um. So, Paul, let's start with your journey. How did, did when did you go vegetarian or vegan? And how did this become your career to create a healthier meat? I'm very happy to answer that question directly, Glenn, but I would be remiss if I did not point out that you have occupied one of my favorite professions, which is that of a stand-up comedian. And my wife oh. and I go to see stand-up comedy often, which is a very lively scene in Sacramento where we live. Um, but because I know that you have a love for jokes and humor, I'm going to tell you one of my favorite jokes just to start out here so that you'll get uh, one of my all-time favorites. I did not make it up, but... Did you All right, ladies and gentlemen, a little stand up from Paul Shapiro. Give him a hand. Uh, Glenn, did you hear about the um, Christian missionary who went to Africa to convert people to Christianity? He was walking out on the savannah and he felt this tension in his back. And he looked behind him and his worst nightmare came true. There was a lion stalking him. So he starts walking, the lion starts walking. He starts jogging, the lion starts jogging. He starts sprinting, the lion is now sprinting after him. The missionary thinks there's only one thing he can do. The best thing he knows how to do, drops to his knees and prays. He says, dear God, please let this be a Christian lion. And all of a sudden, the lion stops sprinting, drops to his knees, crosses his paws, and he looks up to the sky and he says, dear heavenly father, I thank thou for this meal that thou hast prepared us before me. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, Pretty man. Good. <laughs> Where did you hear that one? Gosh, it's probably something that my grandfather told me a very long time ago. So uh -huh. I, I don't know. I I, I have um, for some, you know, there's many things that I'm quite deficient at, but remembering jokes is not one of them. So uh, like I, I really remember like a whole repository of jokes that I've heard. I, mean, I don't tend to make up material, but I can remember them pretty well from what other people tell me. Yeah. Um, but if, if you think I'm going to uh, get, you know, get a gig at the improv, let me know. Maybe I'll change my career, but I, I might have to stick with uh, with alternative proteins for now. You know, in the middle of that joke, it reminded me of a joke I used to do in San Francisco that I wrote. I'm ready. Um, it was, uh, I said, you know what I like to do sometimes when people are walking down the street, I like to walk right next to them. So I find that what happens is they speed up. So then I speed up and then they slow down. So I slow down and then they speed up. So I speed up. And I find that when you do this long enough, people will eventually just stop and give you their money. <laughs> so 
Uh, that's good. That's Haven't good. told that joke in 30 years or more, but... It's good. No, you dusted it off well. It's very good. All right. Thank you very much. It, it reminds me a little bit of um, uh, Bill Burr, who is a, a very funny comedian, has a line that he has. So I, I have a pit bull as a pet. And he has a pit bull as a pet. He talks about how he loves walking down the street with his pit bull because he's never felt more like a king than when he walks with his pit bull. Everybody moves to the other side of the street. Nobody wants to talk to him. Everybody <laughs> gives him a wide berth. He says, it's like the closest thing I have to feeling like royalty ever, just walking down the street. And the whole sea is part for me anywhere I go. <laughs> well, pit bulls are a very controversial subject. So let's go right to the controversial subject then. Okay. You yeah. know, some people say pit bulls, they, they bite, they hurt people. Uh, pit bulls aren't a good pet. What do you say to those people? You know, um, I, I've had two and I have um, fostered many. A hundred percent of them have been friendly. Now, of course, I don't think animal shelters are going to give out to foster homes aggressive dogs, right? Aggressive dogs are not likely to make it out alive from animal shelters. So there's a bit of self-selection here. Uh, they are stronger than many dogs. Uh, you know, they're just incredibly strong animals. Uh, however, my experience with them is that they're overwhelmingly friendly, overwhelmingly loving, and that if they're treated kindly, they make amazing family pets. And so my wife and I have fostered probably half a dozen pit bulls in the last few years. And um, I'm a big fan of them. Now, you know, look, any, any dog, no matter the breed, who's aggressive is a real problem for somebody to have. And you have to, you know, handle that very appropriately. But all the pit bulls in my life uh, have been quite the opposite. And in fact, you know, maybe about a year ago, my dog actually got bit by a golden retriever and he just cried he didn't even bite back i kind of i wanted him to fight back honestly i was like you gotta stand up for yourself buddy um but he wouldn't uh so you know it's pretty interesting i i, I think the you know the maligning of pit bulls is unjust um it does it's not to say that there haven't been cases where abused animals lash out that obviously can happen and because they are so much stronger than many other breeds that can be a concern but, you know, there, there's always like the villain of the day, right? If it's if it's not pit bulls, uh, before it was Rottweilers or Dobermans, and many people who have those dogs know them to be quite loving as well. So uh, I, I love pit bulls, and um, they're a lot of fun, and I love wrestling with my dog, Eddie. And if you want to see more about, um, if you want to see more about his life and videos of him, he's on Instagram. He's Eddie the Pity. It's E-D-D-I-E. The Pity, P-I-T-T-I-E. So check out Eddie the Pity. If you want to see what my pit bull looks like and how he interacts with children and the elderly, uh, I think you'll have a fun time. All right. Um, okay, now let me answer your question directly yeah. here. You uh, you asked me how I got into this. And actually, they actually it's a perfect segue here because it has to do with dogs. Um, so I grew up in a house where my mom worked at our local animal shelter. And so I was very sensitized to the plight of dogs. We always had three or four rescue dogs at a time. And, you know, it's a household that, you know, you, you were told, I mean, e even, you know, my mom would say all the time, like even in the Talmud, they said, you have to feed your animals before you feed yourself. So we had to feed the dogs before we ate dinner ourselves. Like, so this was a very dog friendly household. Um, and at the time, you know, this is now, you know, 30 plus years ago, I perceived that as meaning it's an animal friendly household, but it really was a dog friendly household and didn't really uh, bleed into other species. So a friend of mine showed me a video. It was like a VHS tape. Now you, Glenn, of course, know what a VHS is, but for your younger listeners, it was <laughs> a rectangular piece of plastic that you slid into a machine and you watched a video, right? right. Um, and it showed what happened to animals on factory farms and in slaughter plants. And as I was sitting there watching these animals who were terrified for their lives, who were suffering immensely, I thought, you know, what would I do if those were my dogs, right? If instead of pigs or chickens or turkeys or cows, what if they were my dogs who were hanging upside down, having their throats cut open and so on? And I thought, of course, there's nothing I wouldn't do. There's nothing I wouldn't do to prevent that from happening to my own dogs. And I, so therefore I thought, why should it happen to any? And so at that time I became a vegetarian. Now, I didn't know what vegan was. Uh, I was, you know, I was very young. I was like 13 years old. And um, so I wrote to the animal protection organizations for more information about vegetarianism. And so they sent me back literature. And I learned that there was this thing uh, called vegan, right? V-E-G-A-N. And I, I thought it meant vegan, right? <laughs> that was my understanding. Uh, and I, I thought, you know, it seemed like a noble thing to do. But I also thought it's, it, it seemed like impossible, right? It seemed kind of like, 
holding your breath. Like, you know, you can hold your breath for a long time, but if you do it too long, you're going to die. And I thought maybe that's what one of these vegans is like, right? They can not eat animal products for a certain amount of time, but you do it too long, you're probably going to die. So then I went to volunteer for one of these organizations and I met people who I learned were called vegans. And many of them have been doing it for a really long time, years on end. And I thought, wow. And then I read this interview that they gave me with Carl Lewis. Now, for your younger fans, Carl Lewis was like the top Olympian of that era, right? He was like the Usain Bolt or the Michael Phelps, like the number one Olympian, the best athlete in the world, as far as I was concerned. I had a poster of him in my room in my parents' house when I was growing up. I really like idolized Carl Lewis. And Carl Lewis said that he not only was vegan, but that the years that he, after he became vegan, he started winning more gold medals. <laughs> I thought, you know, it, it, first of all, not only is this good, a good thing to do for animals, but now the number one athlete in the world, as far as I was concerned, is a vegan and saying it improves his athletic performance. I was in. And so that was in 1993. And I became vegan. And uh, my parents were very concerned about my health, but they thought at least it would just be a fad. And a few decades later, the fad, <laughs> the fad continues. And my parents are pretty close to being vegan themselves, actually. So it's been, fun, man. it's been a fun time. And um, did your parents uh, willingly uh, go more and more plant-based? Yeah, th at first they were pretty opposed to it, to be honest with you. Um, they were very concerned because back then, you know, people didn't know much. There was no internet. You couldn't look up things. It was just, you know, like they were very like raised in the four food groups type mentality. And so they were just thinking like, this is not good for anybody, let alone a growing teenager. And so they got out a copy of the Yellow Pages, which for your younger listeners is what Google was before we had Google. And they looked up a nutritionist and they just looked up one who was located near us and they asked me to go see her. I didn't even know what a nutritionist was. I never heard of it. And I mean, honestly, Glenn, this is like by, you know, divine intervention. We went to this nutritionist again in 1993 in Rockville, Maryland. And by the sheerest of coincidences, she herself was vegan. I, I mean, it's like unbelievable to me, truly unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and so that was really helpful. And then when I started, you know, bringing other vegans into my life and meeting my parents, uh, I think they realized like, hey, you know, maybe this isn't a cult and maybe this is something that, you know, isn't gonna uh, kill or stunt our child. Um, but they became far more um, uh, plant-based as time went on, especially my mom. We, uh, from, I remember for my 16th birthday, she asked me what I wanted. I said, I want to go to Farm Sanctuary in Watkins Glen, New York. And she brought me to uh, Watkins Glen and we went. And since that day, this is now in like 1996, she has never eaten a land animal since. And she claims that if they had rescued fish there, she might be a full vegetarian. <laughs> So, you know, that, you know, that's now, you know, like 25 years ago or so that she became a uh, uh, near like a pescatarian. And uh, my father is pretty close also. Um, so I'd say probably like my guess is like 85% of their calories come from vegan sources now. Right. Uh, and they're both live, you know, they're both in their uh, mid to late 70s and, and, you know, they're getting along. So I'm um, very glad for that. Good. So how do you go from becoming a vegan as a teenager? to getting interested in creating a cleaner form of meat? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a quixotic journey, to be honest with you, Glenn. So let me give you the, the very abbreviated, it's not gonna be Cliff's notes, it's gonna be Glenn's notes here for you. So the Glenn note version is the following. I was very passionate when I uh, became interested in animal protection. And I had the zeal of like a religious convert, you know, like always the converts are always far more pious than those who are born into something. And so there was no, when I entered high school, there was no animal rights club. So I started one, it's called Compassion Over Killing. And I ran that as a high school club at first and then brought it out to a, 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 a citywide organization and then eventually a nationwide organization. And I ran that through um, my high school and college years. And we would do things that were pretty strident uh, we would, uh, you know, I did things like undercover investigations at factory farms and slaughter plants, posing as an employee, taking hidden camera footage of showing what happens to these animals in these facilities. And my my theory of change back then was that if people only knew how poorly animals were treated in the food system, things would change. It's kind of like that that cliched saying 
which is if slaughterhouses had glass walls, we'd all be vegetarian. The Paul sad McCartney. thing. McCartney. Yes. Yeah, Paul Paul McCartney. McCartney. Yes, I know Paul McCartney, Paul McCartney has said it. I don't know whether he invented it or not, but either way, he has definitely said it. Sadly, no matter who said it, it's not true. Most people who watch a slaughter plant video do not go vegetarian, um, obviously. And so I was, uh, you know, making these videos and we were getting a lot of uh, news attention. I mean, our stories were on CNN and the New York Times, the Washington Post. We we're really generating a lot of attention on the plate of animals who were raised for food. But sadly, we were not actually effectuating much change. And meat demand every single year continued rising. And the percentage of Americans who identified as vegetarian or vegan was stagnant. So I thought eventually after doing that for about 10 years, I thought, well, maybe what we need is public policies that are gonna codify uh, public sentiment about animals into law. You know, most people, even though they eat meat, they don't want animals to be tortured. And so I thought maybe we could ban the worst practices, caging of animals so they, they can't even turn around or extend their limbs, um, cutting animals' body parts off without painkiller and so on. And so I became a lobbyist for animals and spent 13 years doing public policy campaigning. And we passed about a dozen laws in various states, cracking down on some of the most inhumane factory farming practices with ballot initiatives primarily, where we put measures on the ballot for voters in California, Arizona, Massachusetts, and more, where they could vote to make it a crime to treat pigs and chickens and cows in these deplorable ways that are common practice in the factory farming industry that you've written so eloquently about in Mad Cowboy and elsewhere. Um, and after about 13, well, e even long before I stopped doing that, I started getting nervous around like 2015, 2016, when you saw the rise of companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods and Eat Just. And I started thinking, you know, what if food technology is going to do more to solve the problem that has animated my life for decades now? I mean, at that point, like two decades have gone by where I've been doing this and the trends were not good. Meat demand kept rising. The percentage of vegetarians, again, remained stagnant, you know, for the last 30 years or so. Uh, you know, the percentage of vegetarians in America of self-identified is like three to five percent. Vegans even less. It just hasn't changed. And per capita meat demand is at, at pretty much at an all-time high. So it's not just that we're adding more people to the country. It's that per person, meat demand has only gone up and up and up and up during the time when since I became vegan. I mean, I remember reading uh, PETA literature back in uh, the mid '90s, lamenting that six billion animals were being were being put through slaughter plants in America each year. Well, today it's like 10 billion, and it's not that the human population has increased commensurately; it that you know has increased, but not commensurately. What's happened is that people eat more meat on a per person basis today than before. So, and they're I, getting I, fatter and sicker, and not living as long. Yeah, that, that's one of the most unbelievable things. Like for the first time since like the modernization of our civilization, we have actually reduced longevity. Yeah. I mean, it's like the trend was increased longevity, increased longevity, increased longevity. Now it's actually gone down. It's it's, it's, it's really sobering. Um, but yes, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And so I started thinking, well, I mean, maybe food technology is going to do more. And I started thinking about this. Like if you look at ways that animal exploitation has ended in the past, it's almost always technology. You know, for thousands of years, we whipped horses to get around. Nobody stopped whipping horses because they cared about them. They stopped because cars were invented or what we originally called, you know, horse, uh, horseless carriages. Um, similarly, we harpooned whales for thousands of years to light our homes. So nobody stopped using whale oil because they cared about whales. They stopped because kerosene was invented and it was a cleaner, brighter way to light our homes. And now we use electricity, um, which, you know, ran kerosene obsolete. Uh, from right. thousands and of just, years. just for the record, Paul, I remember the VHS tapes. I don't remember the horseless carriages. <laughs> okay, yeah, very good, very good. I'm glad we've stipulated that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you know, uh, you know, one other thing you won't remember, uh, but had you been alive, you know, in the early 19th century, you know, everybody was using quill pens. You know, the Declaration of Independence, the Magna Carta. Right. These were all. These were written. The Dead Sea Scrolls. They were written with quills. And I don't remember that. Yes. So, live, my time. you know, live geese were were plucked for their quills and it was a torturous thing. It would be a violation of anti-cruelty laws today, honestly. But nobody stopped plucking geese for quills because they cared about geese. They stopped because metal fountain pens were invented and it was a much more efficient way to write. You didn't have to stop and dip your quill into an inkwell. You didn't have to sharpen the quill tip. And, and you know, now, of course, we don't really use metal fountain pens because we're tapping on glass screens. But the point is, new technology rendered the former practice obsolete. And in all three of those cases, and there's many more, but just those are just three quick examples of horse labor, 
uh, quill pens and whaling, we had practiced them for literally millennia, cornerstones of our economy. And within a matter of mere decades after a new invention, they were totally obsolete. I mean, imagine how shocked you would be today if you know you saw somebody using a quill pen or you know lighting their home with with whale oil, right? Like I mean, you'd be in shock. Um, but yet that was the norm, and and it only stopped because of new inventions. And so I started thinking, well, maybe there are new inventions that will do the same for at, for chickens and pigs as these other technologies did for whales and horses. And I got very interested in it, but I wasn't sure what to do. You know, I wasn't really sure. Like, I, you know, I wasn't a microbiologist. I wasn't a food scientist. I didn't have millions of dollars to invest in venture capital. I, you know, didn't have an MBA from Harvard. Like, I, I was just like a guy who was a lobbyist who was very passionate. So I thought, you know, maybe if I wrote a book about this, I could entice people who actually did have those skills to go into that field. And I was, it was pretty hubristic. I did not you know, have any experience publishing a book uh, before. Um, so I I wrote a proposal and I pitched it. I got very fortunate, just I'm going to really condense it down here. But Simon & Schuster purchased the book. And when it came out, it did dramatically better than I ever would have dreamt. And it was transformational in my life. And it well, really- the book is called Clean Meat. Yes. And I would love to hold up a copy, but I read it on my Kindle. Ah, good for you. You're an environmentalist. Yes. Uh, Yes. So, but yeah. it, it was a bestseller and it's a very compelling story of the sort of the race to create clean meat, yes. lab meat, which we will talk about. But but right. it's the race towards that. Great. Thank you. And I'm honored that you read it, Glenn. It means a lot to me. But yes, so the book is called Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner in the World. And, you know, look, it, 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 it did much better than I dreamt. And it really left me with two options. Either I could continue writing about the people who I thought were going to solve this problem that, again, had animated my life now for three decades, or I could just become one of them. And I chose the latter. And I actually thought about doing another book that would be the history of the plant-based meat movement, you know, going back to ancient China and to Kellogg in the 19th century, all the way up to the Impossible Burger. And I, I still think that's a great idea, actually. I hope somebody will write that book. It's a really riveting story. Um, but I decided to start my own company now, six years ago. It's called The Better Miko. And I teamed up with a friend of mine who actually does have a Harvard MBA so that I could team up with somebody who uh, knows what she's doing. Uh, her name is Joanna Bromley. And I, I often joke that I may be the face of the company, but she's more like the brain of the company. So um, so we've been running this company now um, for the last six years, and we can talk all about what we do. But uh, essentially, we grow mycoproteins or fungi proteins inside of uh, stainless steel fermenters to grow whole food all natural meat alternative ingredients. Um, but that's the last 30 years in a nutshell for you, Glenn. So all uh, right. my, is that every every chapter of my life, I hope I become more effective. Uh, but the goal, the North Star has remained the same during that whole time, which is to try to reduce the animals, uh, reduce the suffering of animals, uh, which has been really the whole premise of my life. Well, I, I am delighted with the, the, the choice you made to, um, to create burgers from mycoprotein, from essentially from fungi. Uh, this is mushroom protein to create not just burgers, but chicken-like meat and fish-like meat and uh, even well, maybe foie gras-like meat, apparently. Yeah. Maybe it'll be like the Model T. I don't know. I, I know that you said you weren't around for the transition to horseless carriages, but I notice above your shoulder there, you appear to have a horseless carriage on, on your uh, bookshelf. Well, there's actually a story behind that. I'll get it for you. Hold on. Okay. Oh, wow. It's a lot bigger than I anticipated. The depth uh, deceived there it me. Is. There it is. And when you wind it up, It plays Camp Town races, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's what happened. It's going to play for a little while now in the background as I speak. But um, my father died in August uh, 2009. Okay. And uh, he was uh, 89, almost 89 years old. And I had this 
this antique little toy car up on my shelf on my bookshelf in, in my home in in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and I think it was about two or three weeks after he died it started playing camp town races all by itself <laughs> okay wow amazing so i yeah. have no explanation for that but uh yeah it was like he he came to say hi one more time he wound it up that's really nice that's really yeah. nice um but yes yeah, so first of all sorry about your father i know it's a long time <laughs> well, ago. So, you know my condolences to you well um, it's a long time ago now yes but i'm glad you have that uh relic to remember him by for sure yeah. Yeah. um yeah so you know i and, you know, to get to the meat of the matter, pun intended, you know, I, I believe that it would be wonderful if people wanted to switch to lentil soup, bean and rice burritos, hummus wraps. I, I love those foods. I eat a primarily whole foods plant-based diet myself. Uh, you know, my, my wife is a plant-based cookbook uh, author who primarily works with whole foods as well. However, people do seem to want to eat meat. And so my goal is to find ways to recreate the meat experience for people in ways that are healthier for them and better for the planet and animals. And so that's why I've gone down this path. If I thought that people were gonna be happy just to switch to lentil soup and the other foods I mentioned, it would be a lot easier. Um, you know, It would be much, much easier to do that than to try to harness the power of fermentation and other technologies to recreate the meat experience without animals. Um, sadly, I, I, I don't think that's what's going to win over humanity. I wish it were. Um, and there are many people who I respect who think that that is possible. I would love to see the evidence. Well, let's divide clean meat into three types. First, there is the uh, the ongoing and as yet unrealized hope of many to create what they call lab meat, essentially okay. working from the cells of animals to grow them in these bioreactors and create meat. Yes. Um, that is perpetually coming in five years, and and those five years appear not to be consecutive. I, you know, I was thinking about your comment because you made this great comment to me a few days ago about that, how these five years are not consecutive. Uh, it's also not stipulated whether they are Earth years. So, That's you know, right. That's right. It, it might be Saturn years, in which case it's going to be a while. There you go. So that ne it never seems to arrive. And there are other criticisms I could make or, or skepticisms I have of the so-called lab meat. I'm not a believer. Um, nonetheless, I was compelled by reading your book about the other the people who are believers and were racing towards it. I, I would, I, in reading it, I would say, well, I don't trust this guy. This guy's interesting, but this guy seems naive. And <laughs> okay, but never still, I go to the supermarket. There's no lab meat. Yes. The second type is the plant based meat. And that, of course, exists. That's the impossible burger and the beyond burger and uh, many other burgers um, uh, that I I get one in the grocery store that has really clean ingredients and I'm forgetting what it's, I think it's called the real plant burger or something like that. Okay. Um, and made from beets and, and uh, some are made from nuts and some, some are made with mushrooms and some are made with, with uh, uh, seeds and all kinds of different plant foods. And then there's what you're doing, the mycoprotein, fungi, not technically plants, um, and uh, mushrooms have extraordinary health benefits. And uh, this product that you have is extraordinarily high in protein um, and high in fiber. Um, so I, I am a believer in the plant burgers and the my, uh, myco burgers. I don't, for, for myself, I don't eat the Impossible Burger and the Beyond Burger because they've got coconut oil and ingredients that I, I don't want. Um, but um, I would love to see uh, mycoprotein uh, uh, become the substitute for meat. Yeah. Um, and, let, let me offer one, one quick comment for you, Glenn. Yeah. So you, you've, you've correctly identified like the three kingdoms, right? There's the plants, animals, and fungi. And you know, we're, we're trying to get to the same end 
with each of those different kingdoms. It, it's kind of like energy, right? Like there's lots of ways to get energy without fossil fuels, wind, solar, geothermal, et cetera, right? But the end result is energy. You walk in a room, you flip a light switch, the light illuminates the room. You don't care, right? Whether it's coming from wind or solar or geothermal, you just want the experience of an illuminated room. And the same is so when it comes to meat for most people, maybe not for you, maybe not for me, but for most people, you know, most people aren't sitting there thinking, oh, I'm so glad that an animal was slaughtered for this, right? They just want the experience of meat that is satiating, that they crave, that they enjoy the taste, it's cost effective. Maybe they're thinking about getting protein, but, you know, probably they're just saying it tastes really good. And I think, you know, I'm a supporter of all three of those ways, of, but I think some of them are more promising for the near term than others. I think that your criticism of uh, cultivated meat or meat grown from animal cells that it, you know, is never materializing is well-founded. This is an industry that has had a variety of timelines that have not been met, and it's going to be a long time before such meat is on the market. Plant-based meat has been on the market for quite some time now, uh, you know, really, if, I mean, honestly, more than a century, but it didn't really get to the new generation until maybe about five years ago or so, or maybe seven years ago with, with the rise of the companies that you mentioned, like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods. You'll be pleased to know that the new Beyond Burger substituted out coconut oil in favor of avocado oil, by the way. So the new Beyond oh, Burger- no Slight longer. improvement there. Yeah. Um, but- um, you know, these are, are good products. They're better for you than animal-based meat, right? They have no cholesterol. They have less saturated fat. Even, even the Beyond Burger, when it did have uh, coconut oil, still had less saturated fat than a regular uh, slaughter-based burger. And, um, you know, these are good products. If you're going to, if you're walking into, you know, a fast food restaurant and your choice is to get a conventional burger or a Beyond Burger, you're better off getting the Beyond Burger. Sure. That's not to say that it is the same as eating a kale salad or a quinoa wrap. Of course not. Um, but it is to say that it is better than the conventional option. In the mycoprotein world, though, going to where, what I do at the Better Meat Co., growing microbial fungi, you get the best of all worlds. You get a product that really is meat-like in its texture, but is still an all-natural, whole food, fiber-packed ingredient. You know, think about the way that you make plant-based meat today. Go, go to the Beyond Burger as an example, right? You got to grow the field of peas harvest the field of peas, mill it into a flour, but that flour is low in protein. So you got to strip out the fiber, strip out the fat, concentrate it down into a, a pea protein powder that like an athlete might take as a supplement. And then you've got something that's protein rich, but it's not textured like animal meat. So you have to subject it to twin screw extrusion, which is a fancy way of saying lots of pressure and lots of heat. That changes the texture of the protein. So it goes from being globular, like a plant protein to stringy, like an animal protein. And then you add, you know, 15 other ingredients to it and you get a Beyond Burger. So that's how you go from pea to a Beyond Burger. And that's why Beyond Burgers are a lot more expensive than beef, even though peas are much cheaper than beef because you're not using the whole pea. You're using a tiny little fraction of the pea and you're subjecting it to these expensive processes. With mycoprotein though, for, uh, on the other hand, with microbial fungi protein, you run a fermentation that within less than a single day creates an ingredient out of that fermenter that in its own natural, unprocessed whole food state not only has an extremely meat-like texture, but has more protein than eggs, more iron than beef, more zinc than beef, more fiber than oats, more potassium than bananas, and it naturally contains vitamin B12, which is typically lacking in a plant-based diet. So you get all the things about meat that you want, protein, iron, zinc, texture, and so on, but you don't get the things you don't want, cholesterol, saturated fat, animal cruelty, environmental degradation, and more. And that ingredient can be used either as a whole food, single ingredient, alternative meat, like as strips of chicken and a burrito, or you can add other ingredients to it and make it into things like a steak or a burger and so on, that's fiber and protein packed. Now you already know this, Gwen, so I'm speaking to your audience and not necessarily you here, but nobody in America, for the most part, is protein deficient. However, nearly everybody in America is fiber deficient. Fiber deficiency is rampant. More than 90% of Americans don't get the RDA for fiber, and our RDA in the U.S. is lower than in other industrialized countries, which are more realistic. But we don't even meet the meager American standards. And where do you get fiber? You don't get it from animals. Animals, you know, we have skeletons that hold us up. Plants and fungi don't have skeletons. They have fiber. That's what holds them up. And so that's why no matter what type of meat you're eating, whether it's grass-fed, organic, whatever, there's zero grams of fiber. Zero grams because animals don't have fiber. However, plants and fungi do, and the fungi that we grow, which is called mycelium, or the root-like structure of fungi, 
is actually packed with fiber and it's intact, great fiber, rich in beta glucans, which are shown to be really good for your microbiome. And so this is a really wonderful food that you can add to your diet. The problem is that while we can produce this in our fermentation system here in Sacramento where I'm based, we can only produce thousands of pounds. We can't produce millions of pounds. So we are not in a position yet to be able to put this on the market nationwide. We have to raise the capital necessary to build much larger fermentation systems in order to do that. And so once we do that, we'll build much bigger fermenters and then you'll see better Miko ingredients in products nationwide. But today we're still working really at what I would consider a pilot scale in Sacramento that proves that the technology works and it's ready to be scaled, but it's just not there yet. All right, we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and I'll ask Paul more about the products that he can create from mushrooms. We'll be right back. If you want to optimize your health by following a plant-based low-fat diet, look into the education, events, recipes, exercise, fun, and more provided by the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group at pbnsg.org. All right, we're talking with Paul Shapiro, the founder and CEO of the Better Meat Company. The website is bettermeat.co. And if you go to that website, you will see very um, enticing looking types of what looks like animal foods, but they are fungi foods. Um, so, Paul, on your website, there are pictures of meatballs and ground beef and jerky and um, foie gras, the only legal foie gras in California, I'll add. Um, and um, out of curiosity, were you did you have any reservation about even calling it foie gras because foie gras has a bad reputation? It's a bad reputation among people like you and me. It does not have a bad reputation among people who go to fine dining restaurants. Mm -hmm. And uh, ironically, I was involved in the passage and implementation of the law in California that bans the sale of foie gras. So uh, for me, it's it's quite well, a nice. You created uh, a monopoly for yourself. <laughs> if I only knew at the time. Yeah. Now, of course, you know, every victory has a thousand parents, and I was only one part of a lot of people who were part of that. But I did work on it, and I'm very proud to have worked on it. And, um, you know, there are other places now in the world and country that have modeled their laws after that. So, for example, um, just recently, Pittsburgh passed a law banning the sale of foie gras. New York has done something similar. Uh, New York City, rather. So there's a, um, you know, a, a trend setting thing here going on to that. Now, of course, you know, the vast majority of people have never and will never eat foie gras, right? Like the number of animals used for the foie gras industry is very small compared to used for, let's say, chicken or beef or, or pork and so on. Um, but it's a very inhumane practice that necessitates the force feeding of these ducks or geese in a way that most people don't want to hear about. But with mycoprotein, we're able to replicate that rich, buttery feel of foie gras in the mouth that doesn't involve using fowl at all. It's a fowl. Well, what, do you, what do you do to make it taste fatty, which I guess right. is what people want in their foie gras? Yes, that's exactly right. Foie gras is an extremely fatty product. It's extremely fatty. And so, you know, this is something that, you know, people call it a heart attack on a plate because it's very, very calorically dense. Now, to answer your question directly, Glenn, you know, the mycelium that we grow has very little fat in it. So if you want to turn it into something um, like a chicken breast, that's very low fat. It's perfect for that. If you want to turn it into something like a hamburger that's fatty or even foie gras, which is even fattier, you have to add fat to it. So in the case of our uh, foie gras product, you know, that basically is mycelium combined with cocoa butter. And it does melt on your tongue in a way that is delectable. However, I recommend eating it in small quantities. Uh, you know, it's pretty rich. And, um, uh, you know, for people like you and me who don't like eating a lot of saturated fat, um, you know, I, I would eat it more limitedly. It is better for you than foie gras uh, in terms of, you know, less cholesterol, less saturated fat and so on. But it is still uh, a product that is more of a delicacy rather than a staple. And it's far better for the geese. Yes, for sure. Um, have you ever tried using whole food fats like nuts and seeds and avocado? Actually, yes. So um, we, for a long time, were making it with cashews. Um, and so that was uh, a, a way to make it. Um, uh, cashews are 
very expensive to be honest with you and so that became prohibitive for us but the original iterations of the mycelium based foie gras were essentially cashews plus mycelium mm -hmm. all right so uh if if people go to the website and look at these beautiful fungi meats um you'll see very enticing images but those are not currently for sale in any supermarkets around the country. As I understand that just in a few restaurants in the Sacramento area, you can get them. Is that right? That's exactly right. You know, Gwen, we run a pilot scale facility here. We cannot supply enough mycelium for nationwide supermarkets from this facility. So we make applications like a steak made from our mycelium. It's highly popular. People love it. And we put them on restaurant menus in our area primarily to showcase the versatility of the ingredient so that people can see what it would actually look like in the wild. The problem for us is that we don't have much larger fermenters and it's a lot of stainless steel that you need to buy. So we're currently in the process of raising a capital round to be able to afford larger fermenters that would enable us to produce a lot more mycelium and actually make ingredients for companies that could put a mycelium-based steak on restaurant menus nation or, or grocery store uh, shelves nationwide as well. Now, how does your dog like this food? Uh, what a good question. So I have a, I, I call it the Eddie test. My dog, Eddie, again, for those of you who uh, will remember from the beginning of the interview, he's a pit bull and he's very finicky. He will not eat fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't like plant-based meat. If I give him a Beyond Burger, he won't eat it. But if I give him a microprotein steak from the Better Miko, he devours it. And I don't tell him, I don't tell him what it is. So he's, you know, he's blind, right? I don't let him know that this is not actual steak. And uh, he, he, uh, he still loves to eat it. So um, I enjoy doing that. You know, I, I, I consider every gram that we make sacred because demand so far vastly exceeds supply. So I don't like to use a lot with him, but for testing purposes, I definitely try it out on him because I view him as a very valuable focus group for us. So the Eddie Have test- Have you tried it on other dogs as well or only Eddie? Yeah, I, yes. We've conducted a lot of animal experimentation in the form of uh, employees' dogs who try the product and it's universally popular. How about cats? Uh, I don't think we've ever tried it with cats. That's an interesting question. I presume a cat would eat a steak. Obviously, that's what cats in nature eat. So- um, uh, we'll do it. Now, we have people here who work here who have cats, so we should try that out. Uh, we'll, I'll let you know when. I'll report back. All right. We'll have to tune back in for that answer. Um, so what is the business model, since you're not currently um, up to scale to produce this meat to go into grocery stores around the country? And again, when I say meat, fungi meat, mycoprotein, um, uh, what's the business plan how do you how do you scale this up? Sure. So we are a B two B or business to business ingredients company. Think about the if you think about like the really big ingredients companies like Cargill or ADM. You know these are companies that sell huge volumes of their ingredients to other companies that then make branded products with them. So when you go to the supermarket, you know you're not going to see a Cargill product on the shelf, but chances are pretty high that many of the products there have Cargill ingredients in them. That's what we intend to do. We want to sell our mycoprotein to the alternative meat companies so that they can make better alternative meat products that are more natural, more healthy, and whole food. And that will be even more delicious. Uh, if it wasn't more delicious, there'd be no point in doing it, right? People buy food based on taste, uh, as you have pointed out elsewhere. So um, that's our goal. So the business model is B2B ingredients, just like Cargill, except you know we don't have tens of thousands of employees. We have two dozen employees. Uh, but the way that we get there is by building a much larger fermentation facility. We've taken a, a process that we invented in the lab and moved it to a pilot scale, proven that it works here, and now we're ready to go to full-scale commercialization. We've already received a number of patents on our processes, so we have good protection on the process. And we have a number of investors who are ready to put in the money that we need, but we're still uh, short on what we fully need in order to actually build a full-scale factory. So we have to raise that capital. If somebody listening is interested in owning a piece of the Better Meat Co., you can contact me um, through the website, bettermeat.co. Again, bettermeat.co. And the point is that once we get there, we will be selling profitably. You know, there's a lot of companies in this space that just are, you know, basically reliant on venture capital money for decades almost. 
And that's not going to be our fate. Uh, our goal is to become profitable once we start up our factory and get to a place where we can uh, quickly start generating enough free cash flow that we can fund future expansions through that rather than having to raise dilutive equity dollars. Okay. Now there's uh, one product that I know of that's a mycoprotein that's been on the market for a long, long time. It's called corn, Q-U-O-R-N. Um, how does your pr product differ from that? Yeah, corn is really like the OG of mycoprotein. They control 99% of the mycoprotein market today. And uh, they're a, a really cool company. For 25 years, they've been selling a product from fungi fermentation. But uh, what they make, first of all, most of their products aren't vegan. They have egg whites in them. Um, and they also require various processes to get a kind of meat-like texture, including freezing. We don't do any of that. We don't add egg whites. We don't have to freeze the product. We get some of this meat-like directly from our fermenter. And the reason is because we use a different organism and a different process. And so think about, you know, like if you think about animal protein, there's lots of animal proteins, right? Beef, chicken, pork, turkey, fish, et cetera. And they all have different textures, different tastes, different colors, and so on. You think about plant proteins, you got soy protein, pea protein, wheat protein, chickpea protein, fava bean protein, and so on. And all of those plants have different textures, different flavors, different protein contents, and so on. And in the world of mycoproteins, you have thousands of species as well, thousands. Corn uses just one of them. Imagine if there was like one animal that everybody ate and, and nobody ate any other animal, right? You just were eating, you know, chickens and there was no such thing as beef or pork or fish or anything. That's kind of what it's like in mycoprotein today, whereas, you know, 99% of the market is corn, which is one species. We have pioneered the use of a different species, in fact, a different genus altogether. And we view real advantages in our species for a variety of reasons. Happy to get into those advantages if you're interested, but it's kind of technical, but basically it, it grows faster, um, has a more meat-like texture, and it also has a centuries-long history of safe human consumption and no allergenicity associated with it. So, and you did, know, did you sample a lot of different, did you oh, experiment yes. with a lot of different types of fungi before you settled on that one? Hundreds, yes, hundreds. So, you know, we screened, we had a whole program of screening different strains of fungi for all these characteristics, protein accumulation, rapid growth, meat-like texture, and so on. And we like our strain because it not only grows fast and is highly proteinaceous, but it's been consumed by humans for centuries. You know, corn's organism, which again, it's totally safe to consume for nearly everybody, um, it, but it's new to humanity. You know, people hadn't eaten it prior to a few decades ago. Whereas the organism that we use is a species of fungi that's been consumed for hundreds of years in Asia. Doesn't have much history in the United States, but it's been consumed for hundreds of years in Asia safely and, and by, by tens of millions of people. So um, that gives me a little bit, you know, greater ease on regulatory approval. You know, it took corn huge amounts of research to prove that its organism was safe, which they did. Um, but it's a little bit easier for us considering the fact that our organism has this very long history of safe human consumption. All right. And I assume you can patent the process, but you can't patent the actual fungi, right? No, you can't. Uh, that, that's not a way that the that patents work. You shouldn't be able to patent an entire species for any right. It's whatsoever, right? It's not like somebody's yeah. going to say, I've patented apples, right? Like any, right. nobody can apples. Right. Um, we patented a process and the process matters a lot when you're dealing with food technology. It matters a lot for the economics, matters a lot for the final product uh, texture and other characteristics. So the way that we make it, I can assure you is a very unique, special way. Okay. And what kind of reception are you getting from potential clients in the, in the alternative meat space? Uh, people love it. So we we basically sell joint development agreements to companies. So um, normally small food tech startups, you know, they're begging the big food players just to sort of sample their products. We have a product though that is so high in demand and so low in supply that we have the food companies basically pay joint development agreement to get samples from us. So large food companies basically, you know, pay us monthly retainer fees in order to get access to small quantities from our pilot plants so they can work with it. So that by the time we have our full scale commercial operation running, that they'll be first in line, ready to commercialize with the ingredient because they'll already be familiar with utilizing it. So that's really how we make money today is through these joint development agreements. And it's another, uh, you know, it's a way, it's another way to really prove the validation of the ingredient and how much people like it, that they're willing to pay for it right now. 
Wow. Yeah, I never heard about of something like that where you're getting income from companies that aren't even really buying your product in any great quantity yet. They're just yeah. buying yeah, it to work. They're buying, they're buying access. That's right. They're buying access to the ingredient. So are you able to reveal how many such companies are doing that? The ones who are public with us, yes. We've done these types of joint development agreements with companies like Hormel Foods, Maple Leaf Foods, which is the largest meat producer in uh, Canada. We have similar joint development agreements with companies in Latin America, Asia, Australia, and more. Now, some of these names you, you, you mentioned are not alternative meat names, they're meat names. Well, they're both. Yeah. So like if you think about Maple Leaf Foods, which again is the largest meat company in Canada, but they also have acquired Light Life Foods. They've acquired Field Roast. So they have their feet in both ponds, right? They, they're giant in animal protein, but they're also running some of the biggest brands in the plant protein world as well. Okay. Um, and uh, how often do you, are, are you able to eat your, your mycoprotein? Are, do you keep a supply for yourself for every week or or what I, I because i consider every gram sacred glenn i don't allow anybody to throw anything out so like if we you know just actually just this week is a good example somebody found a bag in our storage that didn't have a label on it it doesn't have a label so we don't know like which lot it came from when it expires so they want to throw it i said don't throw it out i'm gonna eat it so you know i take it home and i make it myself um, and similarly, uh, anytime you know, we have excess product, I'm very happy to eat it. So I'd say I consume the product probably five times a week. And, um, you know, and, and I'm a hundred years old, but I look like I'm only 44. Wow. So, hey, yeah, it's wow. amazing. Doing well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. How long does this product, how long can it be refrigerated for? We actually sell, sell it in a dry shelf stable form. So it's, it has an almost indefinite lifespan. It's more than wow. a year of product stability. So um, the product then gets hydrated. So imagine, you know, right now people buy like texturized vegetable proteins, they're dry and then they get hydrated and then they're uh, put into a product where same thing with us. We, we, we make a dry shelf stable ingredient that can be kept at ambient room temperature and then it gets hydrated when you're ready to use it. And the companies that are... Um, experimenting with creating foods from from your ingredients. Um, are you helping them, uh, for example, to make the kind of steak you have on your website or the foie yes. gras or yeah, that's part of give that it. information out? We don't just give it out. They buy it in the form of their joint development agreement. So if uh -huh. you're, let's say you're a food company, you're paying us a monthly retainer fee. You don't just get access to our ingredients. You also get access to our food product developers who share not only our formulas, but also other important information about working with this. You know, most people in the food industry are used to working with animal meats or they're used to working with plant proteins. They're not really used to working with microbial fungi. And so there's a lot of expertise that we have in-house that we offer to these food companies that's useful for them. All right. Now, what happens if one of these alternative uh, meat companies says to you, OK, we want it. We want to get, you know, a million pounds a month and you can't create a million pounds a month. You, you say, OK, give us the purchase order and that'll help us get financed or, or what? Yes, absolutely. That, that's ex that's exactly right, Glenn. If they're willing to give us that purchase order, that would be enormously helpful for us in order to get the financing needed to build a larger factory. OK. Um, and, um, do you find that, um, that compared to the plant burgers, like the Beyond Burger and so forth, that the finished product will have a smaller list of ingredients? Yes. Um, Yes, absolutely. Because this is a whole food, right? Like a, a plant protein is an isolate that, you know, doesn't have the fiber in there and so on. So you end up seeing like these companies re-adding fiber isolates back into the formula. Um, and so in this particular case, though, you know, you could have a single ingredient alternative meat. Like I, I use the product as a single ingredient. Um, but yes, uh, I, I definitely am, am convinced that you can shorten ingredient decks by having a more complex ingredient like this. That's not just a protein, but also is mixed with fiber. You know, mycelium is, is basically a bundle of protein and fiber. That, that's really what it is. And mm -hmm. that offers a, a greater complexity to the formula than something that is merely a protein. All right. Now this brings us, or it brings me to a final question I want to ask you about the lab meat, which was largely the subject of your book. 
Um, and as I confessed earlier, I am a skeptic of lab meat. Yeah. But when when all these various characters from different companies have been trying to create lab meat, they've been using the cells of animals and trying to grow those cells in bioreactors, which they can do, but it's highly energy intensive. Um, and it's a, it, it's a, it's a system that could go wrong in so many ways. It can't, no contamination could be allowed. Um, and if, when they get their final product, that lab meat, it's not, it's not going to have the fat of meat in it, is it? You know, it's an interesting question, Gwen. So, you know, first, there are companies that are growing animal fats as well. So there are some companies that are growing animal muscle. There's other companies growing animal fat. However, many of the companies that are growing clean meat, the animal cells from muscle, are just adding plant-based fats to it. And exactly. so, it's so, yeah, so it's a hybrid product. Right. And so that's my point. At the, at the end of the day, they're just going to be like the Beyond Burger trying to create something that tastes meat-like because they're not really growing a steak. We'll see. I mean, the question is how, you know, how do you get there, right? How do you get to mimicking the experience of meat? It's very hard to do it. Like a Beyond Burger, as good as it's gotten, most people who eat it can tell the difference between a Beyond Burger and a conventional hamburger. Um, and so, you know, the question is, can you get there closer if you're mixing, let's say avocado oil with actual cow cells? I don't know. Um, you know, there, there's two levels of criticism against this industry. And, you know, the first is what you've said, which is basically the technological challenges to actually making this work at any viable scale. That is very possible that it won't work at any viable scale. However, you know, there are a lot of smart people in this field who believe that it will work, that they just have to make new inventions and they'll get there. And that this is more like electric vehicles 15 years ago, which, you know, when they were like 0% of the market and people thought that, you know, this was an industry that was never going to take off. Um, and it was never going to go anywhere. But you know, now electric vehicles have more of a supply chain, better logistics, and we can make them more, ex more inexpensively. And so they're now single digit part of the vehicle market. Single digit percentages of cars sold are electric vehicles. And states like California are saying that by the 2030s, they're not even going to allow the sale of uh, internal combustion engine cars. So you know, a product that went from 15 years ago being impossible is now perceived as inevitable. And there are lots of things that were perceived as impossible that are still impossible though, like flying cars, right? Like we're, no, we're you know, not that close to flying cars uh, in the way that we are with electric cars. So is clean meat more like electric cars 15 years ago or is it more like flying cars? And that is still to be determined. So that's one criticism. The other criticism, which is categorically different is even if it does work, I don't like it right? To say that you think it's bad for people or bad for whatever reason, you know, you're going to say it's energy intensive and so on. And so those are more substantive criticisms that I, I, I think that I could part with. I, I can see the first one. The second one, though, you know, there, it's already less energy intensive than beef production, but it's going to get better. And as we switch to more renewables, that will be less of a problem anyway. It'll be a cost problem, but not an environmental problem. Now, the other factor, though, to consider is what happens if we don't do this? You know, there's runaway climate change, as you have persuasively written about, Glenn, that's going to render life on Earth extremely uncomfortable for a lot of species. And we're going to have a huge amount of wildlife extinction. We already do have a huge amount of wildlife extinction. And the meat industry is the number one driver of extinction, the number one driver of deforestation. And so if we don't have animal cell cultivation, you better really hope these other things work because you know, so far plant-based meat has not even come to dominate 1% of the market. You know, Plant-based meat, as good as it is, is still not even 1% of the total meat market. It's barely a rounding error in the total meat market. And so will that change? Will plant-based meat just keep getting better and better to the point where it's going to become like electric cars and people will perceive it as inevitable? I hope so. That'd be wonderful if plant-based meat and mycoprotein rendered cultivated meat obsolete. That would be wonderful. I'm not willing to make that bet though. Um, I think that we need all three of these because I think the, the problem is so dire. The situation is so extreme with the environmental problems and the severity of animal cruelty in the meat industry that we really need all of these. Now, 
you know what I'm doing with my life. When it was time to devote my life, I did not go into cultivating meat. I went into mycelium because I thought it was more promising in the near term. I but, think you made the right choice. Thank you. Um, but, you know, if I were a billionaire and I were looking to spread bets around on things that I thought, I would certainly put some into cultivated meat as well. Well, I've got some plays that I'd like to see on Broadway, too. So <laughs> okay, save uh, that, a little of the money for that. Very um, nice. Very nice. I'm, I'm actually reading Wicked right now. I had no. Did you know that Wicked is like a strong animal rights novel? I did not know that. The, the reason why the witch is wicked is because she is an animal rights activist who joins an underground animal rights, quote unquote, terror cell to try to prevent the wizard from killing and incarcerating all of these animals. And wow. so that, like the whole book is about this. It's not like, you know, it's not like, oh, I just see this. It's like the whole book is about her joining an animal rights cell uh, in order to fight back against the wizard who's going to attack animals. So I, I love the musical, uh, but I'm reading the book and I really highly recommend it. Did the it. musical have any of that in it? Yes, it does have it. It's not as prominent, but it's in there. It is in there. Okay. Um, my, my opinion is that even if the... Uh, even if the hurdles to creating the lab meat are overcome, it, it, I find it hard to believe that it will get acceptance from meat eaters any more readily than the mycoprotein will, and maybe the mycoprotein will get acceptance more readily. Uh, I was reading oh. that in the Florida legislature. They've apparently been working on a bill to make lab meat illegal. That's how scared they are of it or hostile they are towards it. Do you have any insight into that? Yes, it's actually um, entertaining in the fact that you have one group of people who are saying this is never going to happen. It will never be commercialized. And then on the other hand, you have these Florida Republican lawmakers who say, this is such a threat to the meat industry that we need to make it a criminal act to sell it, to sell it. They're not trying to mandate labeling. They're not trying to put warnings. They are trying to make it a crime merely to sell it. This is the party that believes in a free market, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Like this is truly like nanny state coming in, telling you what you can and right. cannot eat. In Tennessee, there's a bill that would not only ban the sale of cultivated meat, but it would create a million dollar fine associated with the crime. Now, keep in mind, in Tennessee, armed robbery carries a maximum fine of $50,000. So, you know, you go and hold somebody up, it's $50,000 maximum fine. But if you sell cultivated meat, a million dollars maximum fine. But if it's we're getting, I'm not going to justify that the bizarre lawmaking, but if you're, if we're getting that kind of hostility towards it from presumed meat eaters, well, this is what makes us <laughs> think... Yeah, it's it's not it's not so much meat eaters as much as it's people trying to protect the cattle industry. Like that's really where it comes from. It's a protectionist measure for a particular incumbent industry. It, it would okay, be like but you, you could be sure that that industry will put money into, you know, uh, propaganda campaigns against oh, yes. the product. They already are. They already are. Uh, I don't, Whereas I don't... they're not taking on mycoprotein, are they? They would, though. I mean, if we were more successful, they would do the same. Like this is going to be the anything that challenges the status quo and the incumbent industries is always going to provoke a backlash. You even see numerous states right now are, are trying to ban uh, the use of terms like soy milk or, um, you know, butter to describe a plant based spread and so on. Right. And, you know, this is just inherent to what incumbent industries do. Uh, when they want to try to squelch innovation that could be threatening to their core business. Well, all the same, I think you're going to be on on firmer ground because you're making a product from mushrooms. You're not claiming that this is, and it's not, that this is animal cells and it's the same thing. You know, it's not, nobody could say, oh, it's a Frankenstein <laughs> kind of product. It's It's yeah. mushrooms. People will make whatever claims they're going to make that they think are effective at protecting their bottom line. At the same time, the polls show, like it, it, there have been a number of polls asking meat eaters whether they would eat cultivated meat. And the most pessimistic polls show 25% say yes. The most optimistic polls say about 78% say yes. So let's just stick with the most pessimistic ones. Even if 25% of meat eaters switched, 
it would have a catastrophic effect on the meat industry. These guys are worried about a 1% decline in meat demand. If you saw actual displacement of 25% of meat, think about the unbelievable cascading effects that would have if 25% fewer cows, pigs, and chickens were being raised. I mean, that, you know, would have a, a, an extraordinary effect. It would be similar to, you know, what happened to the buggy whip manufacturers, right, when cars came out, because, you know, you just didn't need as many whips to whip all these horses. So um, even under the most pessimistic scenarios of what, what people self-identify as what they're willing to do, willing to eat, I, I still would be optimistic about it. I'm far more concerned about how long it's going to be before that becomes an option for them um, than I am about whether they'll buy it or not. Okay. Well, I, for one, am more sanguine about the mycoprotein, the fungi. That's real. You just need a customer to put in that big purchase order. Yes. And then you can you can scale up off that purchase order and then it's real and then it happens. So Let's if anyone that. is listening out there and uh, how can they contact you, Paul? Thanks, Glenn. You can uh, visit bettermeat.co. Again, that's bettermeat.co and get in touch with me through that website. And if you're interested in my book, Clean Meat, just go to the website, cleanmeat.com. Again, that's cleanmeat.com and you can get in touch with me through there too. Very good. Paul, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I will say we started this one with uh, one of my favorite jokes and I'm going to end it with one of my favorite jokes too. So oh. did you hear, um, I don't know if you heard about the uh, 90 year old Saul Manklowitz. He was on his deathbed and his family was gathering around watching him take what appeared to be his final breaths. His breathing is getting slower and slower, but all of a sudden in wafts into the room, a scent. And he goes, ah, my wife, Ruth's famous apple cake. And he motions to his grandson. He goes, please go fetch me one piece of my wife's famous apple cake. So eating it can be my last experience on this planet. And his grandson sprints downstairs trying to beat the clock. He comes back a couple minutes later, empty handed. And Saul says, ah, where is the apple cake? And his grandson says, grandma says she's saving it for the Shiva. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> on that note, that was a pretty good one. On that note, uh, Paul, thank you so much. I uh, I am hoping to find your your better meat in my grocery store as soon as possible. Let's do it. Thanks, Glenn. Great to talk with you. Take care. This has been the Glenn Mercer Show, where everyone listening turns vegan, regains their health, and annoys their friends and relatives. Find us on YouTube at The Glenn Merzer Show and across all your major podcast platforms. Don't forget to subscribe.